up? How's it going? How are you doing out there? <laughs> oh, how, what day is today? I think it's Friday. Yep. <laughs> got my water, got my coffee. What time is it here? It's eight in the morning. Uh, there is the neighbor is doing some yard work, so not sure uh, if y'all can hear that, but <laughs> hopefully they'll keep it to a dull roar. Uh, if you're just jumping in, feel free to say hey in the comment section. Hey, through visual media, great, great to see you this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are in the world. So uh, we got some fun things on the agenda today. We're gonna keep it pretty chill. We're gonna kind of keep it free flowing. Gonna use the comment section a whole lot today uh, to get some answers uh, and get some feedback from y'all too and get us all talking about things having to do with our businesses as food photographers. So, um, oh, hi Claudio from Ar Ar Argentina. Welcome, welcome. Great to see you. Um, so we're going to get into the topic of what kind of photographer are you? What kind of food photographer are you? And, you know, we can certainly start diving into things like the specifics of the kinds of things that we're photographing, the kinds of food we're photographing. Uh, but, oh, well, hold on real quick. Let's make sure that this is working. Okay, very good. Um, we will get into the specifics of the kinds of things that you're photographing, but it's more so about the purposes and motivations uh, and the specific nuances of the kind of work that you want to do as a food photographer. So we're going to get into all of that. But real quick, let's just check something on the technical side of things. Make sure everything's working as it should be. All right. So feel free to, oh, Eduardo from Scottsdale, right around the corner. Good morning to you as well. <laughs> All right, outstanding. Okay, looks like we're working. Okay, so very first order of business. Before we jump into all the details, one announcement I did want to make is that as of a today, officially, uh, enrollment is open for my course, Profitable Pricing, which has been a long time coming, something folks have been asking for for a long, long time. So it is officially open. It is available. It's linked down in the description box below. It's a step-by-step -step through my entire process of how I price my food photography, product photography, all the and outs. So um, with no further ado, let's go ahead. Let's jump in, shall we? <laughs> so very first thing that I want to do uh, to interact with y'all who are hanging out here live with me this morning uh, is to go ahead and I want you to share your social media handle or your website, wherever it is that you hang out most frequently. Drop that into the chat. All right. So go ahead and drop that in. And then once you've done that, Go ahead and check out somebody else who is posted in the comments section. Uh, so whether that be your Instagram or if you have a blog or a YouTube channel. So go ahead and click through to somebody else who's posted and then go ahead and leave a comment for them, connect with them, follow them, because that's a great part about hanging out here on this channel and the various things that I do uh, in terms of Instagram and my courses is that it's the opportunity to connect with other food photographers. And I know for me, so much of my success and uh, the maintenance of my sanity as a uh, professional food photographer is having other friends in this industry who I can uh, ask questions to and bounce ideas off of and and to just connect with so that you feel like, oh, I'm not so alone in all of this. So go ahead, uh, drop your, just Johanna's done it. Perfect. There you go. Uh, so you can go ahead and follow some other folks and leave some comments because here's the great thing. Everybody who's here has something in common. We love to photograph our food or drinks or restaurants or whatever it is, uh, but there's still that common thread. So feel free to follow and share. So, 
Uh, like I said, when and kind of in the description of this video, and what made me think of this is that, you know, we think about food photography as a niche, and that's like that's the good news, right? Because I think that so many times, you know, we hear from professional photographers like, you have to find your niche if you're going to be successful as a professional. You need to find your niche, and food photographers sometimes we go, okay, well, what's my niche, right? Like, what's my niche inside of food photography? Well, no, no, no worries. <laughs> good news. If food photography is your thing, that is your niche, right? Um, I think it can get more complex from a marketing perspective. Uh, and we'll certainly save plenty of time at the end for some Q&A and we can discuss more of this and answer your questions about it. Um, but you know, when you're a food, when you're a photographer and you do landscape and you do product and you do uh, cars and you do celebrities and you do portraits and you do all these different things, you know, the more multifaceted you become, the more complex your marketing strategy is going to get. Um, so, good news: if food is your focus, that is your niche. So you have successfully landed there. Um, but what I want you to also know, and feel free to use the comment section too to let me know how many of you all. Um, either are working professionally as a food photographer or you plan to work professionally as a food photographer. Like that is your goal. That's what you're reaching toward. Go ahead and let me know in the comment section uh, if that applies to you because I have to think a certain number of you all are. Hey, Kitchen Orama, welcome. <laughs> welcome, Sam. Very good to see you. Hey, the Happy Wiz, great to see you. So, that being said, if you're looking to work professionally as a food photographer, there are so many different kinds of opportunities out there that there is a wide breadth and depth in this day and age in this industry, different directions that you can take food photography and different applications. We can dive into that uh, in a moment. So I'm curious. Let's check out the comment section. OK, good. So we're working toward photographing your own books, planning to do this professionally. Very, very good. So here's what I want to know is I want to know, uh, you know, when we kind of look at the different types of food photography, how many of you are looking to like if you're shooting, if you want to shoot for restaurants, let me know in the comments section, say restaurants, I want to shoot for restaurants. Uh, if you want to shoot for food brands, say food brands, put that in the comments section. Uh, if you're looking to shoot for cookbooks, drop that into the comments section. Let me know that. If you're looking to do food videos, drop that in. Let me know the different kinds of uh, food photography you want to do professionally. Hey, Jennifer, great to see you here. I love it. Towards food photography as a full-time profession. Uh, let's go ahead and pop that in here. So you want to work that, um, mostly do that for food brands and commercial products. So yeah, so there's all sorts of different specializations that we can have in this field related to the different kinds of clients. So now here's what I want to think, want you to think about though, because I think that we have this sort of thought process and I know that this was my perception when I first started food photography. I don't know if any of y'all have felt this way. When I first started, it was like, oh, I'm really only a food photographer. I'm only a professional food photographer. If I am photographing for big brands in big productions where we're working in big studios, with lots of stylists and lots of assistants and lots of gear and all this stuff. Any, anybody else feel that way? What do you get when you're starting out? Um, or you feel that right now? Like that's only like, that's the definition of a professional food photographer. I know that that was the perception for me. And that felt like kind of overwhelming. And that felt like a lot of pressure. Like, how do I even get there? Right. Um, and do I even like that kind of work? But here's what I want you to know is that it's just as valuable and you are just as much of a professional when you're working at your home kitchen table, right? I think back to when I first started my food photography, um, working professionally for businesses and companies, I was shooting on my kitchen table in my home, no additional lights. I was just working with natural light and my camera and that was it, right? I didn't have all the gear, all the stuff, but I still, I look back at that. I was working as a professional. I was getting paid. I was providing a professional service and um, could have successfully, you know, and was successful at then scaling that business up and that the more, jobs you do, the more jobs you take, the more that we can build, we can build up from there. So let's see, let's see. Okay. 
So it's currently your side hustle and you're looking to go full time with food brands. Food brands are an excellent, excellent area uh, to focus on. Certainly uh, a lot of the clients that I work with. Let's see what we've got here. So Maya's Kitchen, you definitely feel that way. No clue how to jump from it's fun, I think I'm okay at it, to real life professional. Again, here's where I want to really give you that encouragement that, you know, I, I go back to some of my very early clients, which were mostly local companies. I think that that is such a great place to start. And when we look at the different kinds of clients out there, um, you know, we think about we've got our large multinational ad campaigns. We can all think of those, right? Like the Kraft Foods of the world, the General Mills, the Coca-Colas, right? And those are the big productions, kind of what we have in our mind about what a professional photographer looks like, right? Um, but the first companies that I was working for, a lot of times were local companies, like the local dairy, right? That they're distributed locally. Um, that their headquarters are here locally where I am. And of course, some of this will be informed based on um, where you're located. But in reality, there is within a certain distance of where you live, there are local companies that you can reach out to and start working with. And that is just as much professional work and meeting a need that a client has. Because here's where I want you to think too. Um, Here's where I want you to think too, is then what, what are the differences, right? In terms of what's different about working with that multinational company, the Kraft Foods of the world, the Coca-Cola's of the world. You know, you think about if we're doing a shoot and we're doing a shoot with a big, huge multinational company versus doing a shoot with a local small company, right? What, what are some of the differences? What are some of the things you can think of? Feel free to drop those in the comment section. Maya says, it seems scary, right? Those big, huge productions, they kind of are, right? Especially if you're just getting started, that can feel super overwhelming. Oh, I like this one. Happy Whisk, I really want to work on my own stuff right now because I want to publish my own book. And you absolutely will, Ivy. I am confident in that. I love it. Oh, <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to Profitable Pricing. For those who didn't uh, get the memo this morning in your inboxes, I did um, open up my brand new course, Profitable Pricing. Details for that are linked down below. Um, but okay. So as far as the differences of those big multinationals, things that are coming off the top of my head is that the local companies are easier to access, right? When I think about, okay, if I want to shoot for... I don't know, what's it, what's like a big brand? Like <laughs> um, Coca-Cola, right? It's, it's kind of the ever-present example. Uh, who do I even contact? Where do I start? Do you know how many people work in marketing and advertising? How many different, I mean, they probably have multiple different advertising agencies supporting their marketing efforts, right? So it's not just like one person, as opposed to thinking about the local cream cheese company that I started working with when I first started out working professionally, that they have one person in charge. And that person is has a lot of different hats and is fairly easy to access and their information is fairly easy to find. So, you know, before we start like trying to shoot for these big, difficult to access, complicated situations, like again, assess what's near you, what's local, what's accessible, um, because that's just as much professional work as those bigger brands. Um, the other thing too is that when we get into a shoot, when we've got a big, gigantic company, guess how many opinions are going to be weighing in on that work and different stakeholders and different people who are going to want to see different things out of the images you're shooting or the videos you're shooting versus a local company. My, my experience so many times is that they're generally like, we know we need this, but we kind of need, um, you know, your creative prowess and skill sets to bring to this equation. So they don't have quite as many strong opinions. And so you have a little bit more flexibility and creativity. So again, it sort of also takes that pressure off. So uh, something else is that the budgets, the budgets are very different, right? Can you imagine? I mean, I don't know what the numbers are, but just imagine what those big companies in the course of a year spend on advertising is massive. I mean, you think about what's the cost of like a Super Bowl commercial, right? Um, and as we see the rise of like influencer marketing and digital marketing and how that's changed things, that those are massive budgets as opposed to our smaller local companies, local restaurants, local businesses, 
taxes. That's a much smaller budget. So of course that's going to, um, you know, alter maybe your approach in terms of pricing and in terms of numbers, but still an important consideration as far as, uh, you know, how that's going to impact your bottom line and how that's how you're going to approach um, those different opportunities. And then, like I said, also the expectations for the shoot, something that is very typical with really big productions where we're working with big companies through advertising agencies, things like that, is that there's kind of this dog and pony show, right? That you that there's a certain expectation that on shoot day and through the process um, that the client is made to feel extra special and that we do things like, you know, get special gifts. And I mean, it can get really over the top. I don't think it's maybe quite as wild and crazy as it um, once was, but we're we're outlaying a lot more expense for that production to kind of put on a show uh, for the client, as opposed to when I was shooting for the local cream cheese brand when I first got started, it was just me all by myself at my kitchen table doing my thing. So again, you know, and there's of course plenty of opportunities in between those two extremes where you can find kind of the sweet spot that works for you. Now, if you have this vision that you're like, I want to be like, the big time advertising photographer for food and product. And I want the big production. I want to be in the big studio. I want all the lights, all the things like that is awesome because we need, we need those kind of photographers in the ecosystem. It's an important part of the industry, but I don't want to discount the value of folks who are just getting started or you've been doing this for a long time and you're super duper happy working with smaller brands, working on your own schedule, working on your own time, right? Like there's, there's flexibility and there's options um, and that you can also mix and match the different kinds, right? Like maybe you do one or two big shoots in a year, but then you kind of fill in the gaps with a lot of smaller shoots. So I want you to think like there's not necessarily one solid definition when somebody thinks about like what kind of food photographer are you, um, you know, that it doesn't just look one particular way that this is exactly how it has to be. Because especially too, in this day and age, 2021, the industry has changed wildly. <laughs> and there's so much value to being able to be one of those one stop shops that you can do the styling that you can do the photography, you can do all those things uh, under one roof, that can be really helpful for a lot of brands and businesses looking for that kind of photographer. So let's see what else has popped into the comment section over here. All right. Oh, very good. See, and I love this too. I think this is really important uh, to be aware of. Robert makes the point of you're a hobbyist who enjoys the challenge of shooting food. And I want to absolutely like affirm that for folks too. Um, you know, and if that's where you're at and you're like, you're feeling this compulsion to make money at it, but really you just want to enjoy it as a hobby because there is sort of this added pressure when you take something that you love and turn it into a profession, it, it changes your relationship with it a little bit. So I think that really having a good sense of um, who you are and what your goals are in the food photography that you're creating, or if you are your own client, you know, that can be that can be an option as well, you know, when you are shooting for your own blog or your own content. So, all right, here we go. Oh, I love this. I love this. Jennifer, Dr. Pepper, you know, Mr. Simon is like the hugest Dr. Pepper fan I ever met. Like, I mean, the man is obsessed. Now, here's the thing, though. They haven't called you. Have you called them? That's the question, because that's the other thing, too. Right. When we talk about marketing ourselves as food photographers, it is a much more effective practice to start knocking on doors and pitching your services. And I've got some different videos. There's a video I did. It was right. It was in January. If you've missed it, it has an actual script of like when I email a prospective client, like what it is that I'm writing in there. So feel free to refer back to if you just look back in the videos list here on YouTube and look for the one that was right around the first of the year. Um, three things to make more money, I think, in 2021. Uh, that that was one of the things is making those outbound contacts, those outbound calls. I know you can do it, Jennifer. I have absolute faith in you. I love it. Okay. I love it. Oh, this is fantastic news. 
you've been following the videos and you've nailed a few jobs at different cafes, I am so excited for you. And that is like the best news ever. Hearing all of y'all, you know, leveling up those skills and being able to put it into practice. I'd be curious, you know, for those of you who all shoot for restaurants, you know, is that that's a that's a wild experience. I remember a lot of my early clients too were local restaurants because that same idea that I just talked about about having access to local brands, all go lo local restaurants, that the access there is much easier. Um, who are the stakeholders? There's less people than those big, complicated, uh, larger clients. And so that can be a, a great place to cut your teeth. And I'll tell you, there's nothing like a restaurant environment. Anybody who's ever shot in a restaurant, you, you know, or if, even if you've worked in a restaurant, you know that it is a fast moving environment like it's there's a certain amount of intensity there's like this constant sort of buzz <laughs> going on in this space and i'll tell you like even if you're not necessarily interested in shooting for restaurants i'd still encourage you to go out there and do some of that because i feel like sort of being in that environment and that energy it can sort of create this like it definitely your, your skills will grow you know that's always been my experience when i uh, am in those you know in those moments in those kinds of shoots and where i'm having to really like think quickly on the fly and there's a certain amount of pressure like i always come away from those going okay oh, yeah, i did that and i feel so much stronger for it so i'm sure anybody else who shot for restaurants if you've had that same experience let me know in the comments section ah i love it i love it Oh, so Noor has got a good question as far as translation. Um, here on YouTube, I believe there is translation services there, you know, that it translates it, at least in terms of the captioning. Um, in terms of my courses, I would absolutely love to translate to all the various languages, but unfortunately it's cost prohibitive. So um, they are closed caption in English, uh, but unfortunately to, to cover all the languages would probably put me out of business <laughs> as an educator. Um, so, so thank you for understanding that. Um, I love it. I love it. Okay. So we have this good sense of these different kinds of clients. One other clarification that I want to make, you know, I kind of always take myself back to when I first started in food photography and working professionally and the things that I didn't understand, you know, I'm sure plenty of y'all have seen that video, eight things I didn't know before going into my first photography gig. Um, you know, but I always like to take myself back to that place of things that I didn't know. And one of the things that I think is super duper helpful to clarify in terms of what kind of photographer are you is understanding, are you a commercial photographer or are you a consumer photographer, right? We talk about commercial photography and you maybe you hear that term and you think that has to do with advertising and advertising is a part of commercial photography, but commercial photography is this overarching sort of larger category of anytime we are doing photography for a business, right? We are photographing images, we're creating videos for the purposes of another business to use that as opposed to consumer photography where the end user is somebody who is gonna use those photographs and use them personally, okay? So consumer versus commercial. Now there's also editorial is its own sort of subset, although a lot of times that kind of gets paired up with commercial photography, but editorial being when we're shooting for magazines or publications where we're not explicitly selling something, uh, but there's sort of that business aspect of working with a magazine, um, but we're not selling something, we're using that as editorial content to tell a story. So you think about, you open up the pages of a magazine and you have the advertisements, which those are commercial photography, um, but then you have the articles and the images that goes with the articles, that's considered editorial. So I feel like it's really helpful to decipher the differences between those and to delineate that those are different. Um, because when I first started out in food photography and wanted to make a business of it, I realized like all I saw was education related to wedding photography and newborns and <laughs> families and senior portraits, all that kind of stuff. And but what's what's the difference there? Well, food photography is not typically is not consumer photography. All of those are consumer photography. So the way that you price that kind of work, the way that you work with those kinds of clients, the ways that you serve those kinds of clients is going to be different compared to how we work with 
businesses who are making a profit off of the use of our images, right? So I just really think that's a helpful designation to make. When we talk about commercial photography, whenever you hear that term, that refers to that larger category of anytime we're shooting for a business. So hopefully, hopefully anybody who wasn't familiar with those terms is now like, aha, got it, got it. <laughs> Ah, I love it. I love it. Okay, let me get back to my notes because I did write some notes today. Sometimes I'm organized. <laughs> so we've talked about the idea that no matter where you fall in the spectrum, whether you're a big shooting for those big multinational companies and you're doing these big productions in big studios, that's just as professional as working at your kitchen table, working for a client, local companies, shooting at local restaurants. Like all of that is necessary for our industry and for and for the ecosystem that is the content creation space. And you know, I've said this for years. I've literally said this for like 15 years. And now, I mean, it continues to be more and more relevant and it continues to be more and more true. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, y'all, like, what is this going to look like 10 years from now? But this is the best time in the history of the world to be a creative person, to make money off of, and to be able to make a sustainable living off of being creative. Cause you cannot automate creativity, right? Like the unique vision that you have when you approach your photography, you approach your videos, you approach content creation, like that is uniquely you and that is uniquely valuable. That's not something that can be just easily replicated or automated. Uh, and that the need for content, the need for imagery is bigger than ever, right? Like brands used to do, you know, one or two shoots a year. Now they're doing tons, right? And some of those are big, huge campaigns, but some of those are smaller campaigns. And they're not just working with one, one photographer, they're working with lots of photographers. So again, it all depends on the companies and the kinds of clients that you're gonna be servicing. Uh, but know that there is so much opportunity out there and I know it can be scary. I don't know if anybody else feels like this, um, but absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it's well worth taking that leap and taking that deep breath and pushing yourself forward and knowing that if you weren't scared, you, you might, there might be something wrong, right? Anybody who feels like 100% confident, like I'm ready, let's go, let's do this and like no fear at all, I'd say there might be something wrong with that person, right? Like there should be some sort of fear and trepidation. And so lean into that and do it anyway. I'm, I'm scared all the time. I'm scared before I even get on these, right? But then once we show up and we start to do it, uh, we learn and we grow and we progress. All right. So as far as if you are just getting started, because it sounds like from the comment section, we definitely have folks who are getting started um, and you're like, OK, wh where do I even begin? Again, begin local, begin with those local companies that the access is easier. So I think about for me, you know, there is a local cream cheese company. There is a local dairy and finding out who are the people in that organization. You can do some research on LinkedIn. Like for me, you know, the local dairy was Shamrock Farm. Farms. So I go to, you know, LinkedIn, look up Shamrock Farms, look for who's in their marketing department, craft an email. You can use that email that's been in the videos that I've uh, shared previously, put together an email and, and send it off and say, you know, here's what I do. Here's who I am. Uh, if you need photography services, I'm available, you know, kind of making those initial introductions. Um, also something though, kind of before you even get to that place is start a list. I can't tell you how many food photographers out there are like, I want to start working for clients. And I said, great, what kind of clients? And they're like, well, clients. <laughs> I'm like, let's get specific. So whether you create like a Trello board or you create just a, you know, a Google Doc or a spreadsheet, whatever it is, start a list for yourself. Like I'd, I'd say give yourself a goal if you if you haven't done this before, give yourself a goal of 50 clients, like kind of create that as your hit list. If you want to be like super extra and really guarantee some success, let's add 100, 100 prospective clients. And again, if you're just getting started, like make sure to like, let's figure out who are these local companies who may be in my vicinity. 
That being said, it doesn't have to be local. Um, one of my early clients uh, who I've actually still, who I still continue to work with, I worked with for years, they're based in California. I've never met them before in person. We've spent some Zoom calls together. We've gotten to know each other well over the years, um, but we've never physically been in the same space together. So it doesn't have to be local, um, but still that consideration of what are, what are brands and companies that would get you excited too, that um, they're the kinds of products or they're the kinds of companies that you enjoy and that you would enjoy shooting what it is that they do or they have. And it can go beyond, you know, we think about what are kinds of clients. Well, there's food brands that's sort of like easy to identify in restaurants, um, but there's also trade organizations, right? You think about um, like the Specialty Food Association or you think about the local restaurant association. I made connections at my local restaurant association when I very first started out. Uh, and that was a really great relationship because guess what? Not, not only did they need photos, but then they had a network of other folks uh, reaching out to local magazines, local newspapers, you know, making, making those local connections. That can be a really great place. But starting that list, if you don't have a list, it's really hard to like follow up and measure if you've done the work. So start out with that list of 50 and then start from there. Once you've got that, then make sure that you have some sort of portfolio and usually that's going to be an online portfolio. Um, you know, you can check out what I've done. It's not it's not complex. It's not complicated. Pretty, pretty straightforward at JoniSimon.com. Feel free to check out my portfolio. It's fairly straightforward and simple. And there's plenty of things that I look at it and I'm like, oh, I need to add that and I need to do that. And, you know, it's like always a work in progress. Anyone who ever feels like, ah. Oh, my website is perfect and complete forever and always. That's that's never going to happen, right? We're always adding to it and growing it. So it's kind of something that's on my to-do list. But make sure that you have a website so that when you do reach out to these folks, that they can see the kind of work that you do. Now, something that's going to give you a leg up is if the content that you're posting in that portfolio uh, matches the kind of work that, you know, the kind of imagery that those folks are going to need, right? So if you want to get hyper specific about it, say, for example, you're like, I really like, I feel ready. I'm going to pitch Bon Appetit magazine. Well, what kind of imagery does Bon Appetit magazine generally have, right? Like, look, like, look through the pages of it. Look at what they're currently doing. Um, look at their brand colors. Look at their, you know, marketing materials, all that kind of stuff and sort of do some of that research. It does take time, but it's well worth taking that time. Um, and then make sure that then you have images in your portfolio that would speak to that kind of work. Uh, especially the more sophisticated the client is, the more specific and particular they're going to be about that style. But again, so then we go back to that idea of the benefit of working with local companies is they may not have those particularities and be that specific in the look that they're going for. And so just great quality imagery of what you already have is a great place to start. I'm starting to see these differentiations of the different areas of the market. I, I hope so. I hope so. I hope this gives you some encouragement because I think so many times when we talk about marketing and, and business and getting started as a food photographer, like we're talking more about where you'll be several years down the line, how to kind of up level and reach for those bigger clients and those bigger um, opportunities. But like, again, there's so much to be had at, at the local level, at the smaller level, and that you don't necessarily need all of those sophisticated tactics to get in the door and start shooting and start making money at this, okay? All right. So start local, start a list. I'm going to say, let's go ahead and set a goal for ourselves. Can we set a challenge for ourselves that if you don't have it already, that by a week from today, so today is the 16th, week from today would be the 23rd, Friday the 23rd, have for yourself created a list of at least 50 potential clients that you'd like to work for that you can reach out to. And again, you know, put some put some stretch goals on there. Don't be afraid to put some folks that you're really, like, I'm nervous. I, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Like, you're never going to be ready. Just what's the worst that could happen? They ignore you. They say no. 
they say not right now. I mean, it's, it's not bad, right? There's a lot worse things that could happen in life. And this is, this is not that painful. This is not that bad. So create that list of 50, set yourself a due date, something else that, you know, when we were first getting started, I said, follow, follow some of these other folks who are here in the chat right now, feel free to you know scroll back up and find each other's social media handles. Or if you have other friends who are in the food photography industry, other connections on social media, other places, like let somebody else know know that you're setting this goal for yourself, that a week from today, I'm going to have that list. Now, of course, you have to do something with that list. You have to actually reach out to those folks. But I feel like first good starting place is creating that list. Um, and so set some accountability for yourself. Tell somebody else like, hey, I'm going to do this. Here's my due date. Like I live and die by due dates. And I, I swear it's how I've moved my business forward over the years. Like even if it's a personal project, I act as if I am shooting for a client and that is a due date for that. So the more you can set those due dates, the more it's going to move you forward. And then, you know, if you need to do an upside, a, a update, a refresh to your website, or you need to create a website for the first time, you know, I, in all reality, it should not take you that long to get a website up and running. There are so many different easy platforms. Format.com is um, one I used for years. Right now, I'm using the one that comes with my photo shelter account. There's, you know, Pixie, which is one that, uh, or Pixie Set delivers images, and you can also create your website there. There's Squarespace. Like, there's, you can do this. Like, I promise it should not take you months and months to create a portfolio website. Like, just get something up, and get moving forward, right? Like, let's just act like our pants are on fire and we need to get moving, right? <laughs> All right. Um, and then from that, start contacting these folks. Start, again, setting some guidelines for yourself. Say, okay, here's my list of 50 or 100 and start making those outbound contacts and then make those outbound contacts on an ongoing basis. Continue to follow up with folks because chances are when you reach out the first time, they're not gonna be like, oh yes, we have been waiting for you all of our lives. Thank you for showing up. Um, you know, so many of the opportunities that I've gotten, you know, there was some sort of initial inquiry and then maybe it was months or weeks later that I hear from them. And, you know, but they they may not remember you if you only introduce yourself once. You may need to revisit and reconnect and say, hey, I just worked on this really cool project. Wanted to share it with you. Um, I'm still around if you need food photography. So continuing to nurture those relationships and those connections over time. Uh, because that can just, it's, it's like one of these things you, you're like, oh, it's going to be so like linear and it's going to be so immediate. It's not. It's the building up and the kind of scaling of these kinds of efforts over time that suddenly these opportunities just start to present themselves. Okay. So, and then something else that I've shared before is going out and getting those 100 no's. I don't know how many of y'all have, have taken on that challenge, but 100 no's, the idea of we're going to make these contacts, we're going to reach out to folks and try to get 100 no's because there will be people who will say no. There will be people who say, I'm not interested. Please don't contact me again. You know, like usually people are pretty nice as long as you're not too like you know, slimy and like hustly. Um, but, you know, go out there and find 100 people to tell you no, because inevitably, like just doing the math, there will be people who will in that process tell you yes. So if you can go out there and get 100 no's, that's going to set you well on the path into getting the yeses. And so whenever somebody tells me no, I go, great, okay. Another no on the list, right? I don't take that as a negative. I don't take that as a personal slight. It's just, okay, it's not right now. Great, no, on to the next, right? Okay, very, very good. Hey, Stewart's here, Clinton's here. What's up, y'all? <laughs> so very good, okay. So with that, now, what time is it? Oh my gosh, it's 8.40. How did, how did I just yammer for 40 minutes straight? Goodness sakes, <laughs> taking up all the time. Clinton, good, yes, set that list. You got this. I'm so, I, like I said, there's so much opportunity out there. And you just think about, too, this is something I always keep in the back of my mind, is how many food photographers 
are scared to do that work? How many people are afraid to make those contacts that they're just sitting and hoping someone will call them and posting on Instagram, hoping that the right person will see it and they'll contact them, right? As opposed to me taking the, you know, taking the initiative, moving it forward, right? That that is a lot more powerful. And that I think, okay, for, you know, every hundred food photographers out there, if there's only three of us <laughs> actually pitching our services, guess what? That gives me a leg up compared to those other however many who aren't pitching their services. So definitely, you know, think about that too. It's going to absolutely give you a leg up. And it's something too that it snowballs over time. The more effort you put towards it, it's, you know, definitely feels like kind of this uphill push at the beginning. But over time, as you become more established and as more people start to work with you and as more people then start to refer you, there are plenty of clients now who now refer me to their other friends. Cause guess what happens? Like people who own food businesses, people who own restaurants, people who own hotels, people who work in marketing, they know other people who do that same exact thing. And if they have a great experience with you, they're gonna say, hey, you know, Joni does these really cool like stop motion videos. She did these for us, check them out. Like, I mean, talk about a great way to, uh, you know, clinch an opportunity and to make an introduction. They say, can I connect you? I'm like, yes, yes, please. And that then, you too, if that's a client you like working with, then chances are you probably like to work with their friends too, because they're most likely friends with other people who are similar to them. So, um, so that can be a really great ongoing source and that also snowballs over time. So, oh, this is so good. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Jay Mitch, if you don't ask, it's already a no. Yes. Amen to that. If you're afraid of hearing no, you will never hear a yes. Go for it, Mitch. I love that. That is beautiful. <laughs> Pants on fire. I, <laughs> I just have this visual of like y'all are like lit up and your pants just burst into flames and you're like, I'm running. Here we go. Let's go get some clients, right? <laughs> Ah, yes, 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 yes. Oh, I'm so glad that's resonating. Yes, it's so much of what holds us back is just being afraid. It's fear. Um, anybody who's a big fan of Dune, any Dune fans out there? You know the quote, fear is the mind killer. Oh, that's a fave, that's a fave. Don't let fear kill your mind, right? <laughs> David, yes, what is up? I'm glad, I'm glad you're appreciating that. So with that, what we're gonna do now here for the last, I mean, I'll stick around however long we wanna hang out here. I saw there were some questions a little further up, so I'll scroll up to those. But um, if you've got questions, feel free to pop those in. Anything we've talked about here today, um, certainly just as a little re-mention because it's so exciting that today is the very first day that Profitable Pricing is officially open for enrollment. So if you don't have a handle on your pricing situation and how to scale that based on the different kinds of clients that we talked about here today, from those small companies to those big multinational companies and everything in between, licensing, all that jazz. I have a full comprehensive course on it. So um, that is linked down in the description box below. So feel free uh, to check that out. And if you have any questions about that, happy to answer those uh, too. <laughs> 100 no's, go get those 100 no's, you can do it. I mean, you think about, just take yourself back to when I first started, before I was a food photographer, I was a salesperson selling computer systems to restaurants. Anybody who knows the point of sale world, POS systems. Um, and I, I had a goal, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but I had a certain quota of cold calls that I had to make in a week. And not just like cold calls on the phone, but cold calls like showing up to a restaurant unannounced and introducing myself, right? Like, I mean, talk about, <laughs> so just always think, if Joni can walk in, unannounced to a restaurant I got now that is a situation where you'll get chased out or you'll deal with like gatekeepers folks who are like oh here comes those salespeople because restaurants get hit up by a lot of salespeople to to I mean you know, I I completely empathize um but there was one guy who like yelled me out of his restaurant so you know if that's the worst that could happen I survived <laughs> you can survive it too ah. Oh, I love this. This is so true. You might feel a little bad when you get the first hundred or so no's, but over time getting a no really doesn't mean that much. Absolutely. So it's, it's exposure, right? The more you expose yourself to these things, the less problematic it becomes. I love it. Okay, I'm going to scroll up. 
Oh, okay. Here, let's see. Wondering if you have or plan on some kind of course on composition, manage your wife's YouTube video editing, filming, and thumbnails. So as far as composition is concerned, um, I, I always love to refer out my friend Rachel Kornick from To Love Studio. I'm sure lots of y'all here are familiar with Rachel. Uh, she's got a great course, Composition Essentials. Um, so that to me, like, I don't know if I could ever do any better than that. It's like a fantastic course. It's super comprehensive. She's an incredible teacher. If you like my teaching style, I would say you would also really like Rachel's teaching style. She's very um, professional, but warm, very thorough has a great way to explain things. Um, but that being said, I do want to focus more on composition as a topic on the YouTube channel and in other, um, just the free content that I continue to provide. So, so keep on the lookout for that. Although my immediate and current focus, you know, I've got a couple more videos that are in the hopper. There's a new one coming next week that is on using art as inspiration. Um, we talked some, a little bit about composition there. And then I have another one about how you can photograph yourself um, and kind of create a composite of you in multiple places in an image and sort of that bigger like overhead table sort of shoot. So I'm going to take you behind the scenes of one of those. But then after those two videos are done here on YouTube, those are coming out in the next couple weeks, then my focus is really going to be exclusively on video, like video editing, video shooting, all, all the video stuffs, because um, I'm sure plenty of y'all heard the recent update from Instagram about their focus on uh, video, less about uh, stills, which I mean, it is what it is, right? So this, this is, we know this happens, right? There's like a lot of folks who are super frustrated and I get it. Um, you know, the changes that we're seeing in the social media landscape, but you know, this is, this is the ride we signed up for, right? When, when they set the rules, we got to just kind of, you know, roll along. So I'm going to, so I'm going to really create a focus on video content, which I think is also really fun. I love to shoot video. I would say that about half the work that I do for clients, I mean, kind of depends on the project. Obviously a cookbook doesn't involve any um, video content, but I do quite a bit of video work for clients. And so it's, uh, it's an area that I'm excited to share more about and focus more on in this year. Um, all right. <laughs> I love this. So the course Profitable Pricing, which just released today, um, it does come with a hefty dose of the confidence. There is a lesson that is like the, the hype lesson, right? Like after we go through all of the details and nitty gritty of, you know, creative fee and photographer's fee and licensing and, um, you know, terms and conditions and negotiation, like all that stuff. And you're feeling like, oh gosh, okay, what have I gotten myself into? Then I've got like the ultimate hype <laughs> lesson of uh, things to get you boosted up. And then the course also does come with um, access to monthly community meetings where we will hang out on Zoom and, you know, do do some additional education, but then also a hefty dose of like, you can do it and setting some personal challenges and connecting you with other people too. Um, because, you know, I can hype, but it's really fun to have friends who can cheer you on as well. So those are those are all goals that I have uh, as a part of the course. And two, one of the things that I, you know, it's like something that I've always envisioned and is really my overarching goal for launching profitable pricing is, you know, I, I priced it in such a way that I'm trying to make it as accessible as possible while still making it something you do have to invest in because I only want people who are serious about it. Um, to be a part of it, uh, but to really create a place where we can have a lot of transparency about what we're seeing and what's going on in the industry. Because there is sort of like this old way, like the way that it's been done forever in terms of pricing commercial photography, right? And that that's like the way it was. But now like the way that that the work has changed, the way that the clients have changed, the industry has changed, that that is having an impact on how we're responding to pricing and licensing and contracts and all these various things. And so having a place where we can have open dialogue and just transparent communication. And, you know, certainly in the course I share, like, here's my actual estimates that I've done. Here is and something I'm planning for next week is sharing a recent job that I didn't win and why I didn't win it 
it and the red flags that I should have been paying attention to <laughs> um, when having the conversation with the client. Um, so absolutely, hype, hype for days. I'm here for the hype, but it's not, it's not fake hype. It's like the real deal. So, because um, I believe in this stuff. Any promo codes for attendees? So here's the thing. Um, I have had a really strict policy of no discounts. I've never, in the three years that I've been doing courses, never done discounts. Um, so what you do need to know though, is that the price is course, the course is priced right now at the lowest that it'll ever be. It's $199. Um, there is a payment plan option if you need a smaller payment, that's cool too. Um, but it's at the lowest price right now. As of a week from today, the price will go up to 249 and then it will continue to just stay there. Now, what I like to do with my courses, anybody who's seen Artificial Academy, is that I open it, I have an introductory price, and then I bring it up to the level of the price of the course. And then it just continues to be open and it's always available. So if today is not the day, if right now is not the time, if you're like, Joni, I've bought 10 other courses recently, I cannot add one more. I feel ya. I get it. No worries. It's all good. The course will continue to be there and available, um, but this will be the lowest price you will ever see it at. And then what happens is because I am a perfectionist to a ridiculous degree, um, <laughs> is that I continue to make changes and updates to the course. Anybody who, you know, this profitable pricing course, I'm going to follow a very similar model to how I've done Artificial Academy, which when I launched it in 2018 was half the price it is now, but it was also half the course it is now. So it's continued to be updated and redone and new stuff and new resources. So, um, so just know, know that. So no promo codes today, um, but it's the lowest price that it'll be. So there you go. Hey, Nora from Italy. What's up? <laughs> All right. So let's see what other questions we got. Oh, good question here. Any suggestions for a much, must needed, for, I'm assuming much needed macro lens for EF type with a very affordable price. So when we talk about the macro lenses, um, and this kind of applies across, I'll be specific for the Canon. So the 100 millimeter F 2.8 regular. So there's like a regular one and then there's the L. The L is the fancy, it's the sharper glass. It's like, you know, it's fantastic, right? But it's considerably more expensive. Whereas the regular one, I wanna say is like $500. And in the context, I mean, you gotta, you gotta curb this all within the context of photography gear, $500 uh, for a lens is much more affordable than, you know, I, I can't remember if anybody knows what the L series is going for right now. Um, but that 100 millimeter F 2.8, Canon lens is great. It's it's the the hundred mil that I use with my Canon cameras. So um, so that's absolutely my recommendation in that department. I do know there's like I, I can't speak to because I don't have personal experience with them. Um, there's some of the other like the Tamron is it? There's some other brands out there. I don't I can't speak to the quality of those or how they um, how they perform. But the Canon hundred mil f two point eight, it's a champ. You know, and when we talk about like. So when we talk about like the Canon lenses, right? Like there's the L series, which is the sharp, you know, it's the better glass and you get into the Sigma lenses and you've got the art series and that's the better glass and the Nikon mirrorless and it's the S line, it's the better glass, right? So though you're gonna see a price jump from the regulars to the, you know, that better quality glass, which is going to contribute to sharpness and clarity and precision and all these other really great things. But it is also one of those things where I kind of equate it to like wine, right? So, you, you know, you can go to the grocery store and get like an affordable bottle of wine that you enjoy and it's great and it serves the purpose. Now you could also spend like ridiculous money for a great bottle of wine, but like what's that, that like diminishing return, right? Like that, is it really worth like $400 more? And I've got a, a video on the comparison of the regular 50 millimeter F 1.8 and then like the um, Sigma art F 1.2. And it's like, yeah, like there's some noticeable differences, but like, is it that much? Is it really worth that much more money? That's a decision you have to make on your own um, as far as your own budget and what's important to you. So great question. Okay. Oh, I love this one. I love this one. We have a little sip of coffee. Anybody else drinking coffee right now? This is one of my favorite mugs. This is my little Anthropology Fox mug. All right. 
So how do I find my food photography style to build a portfolio? So I feel like there's a lot of pressure to figure out a style, right? They have a signature style. And I would say, like, I, I <laughs> maybe I'm saying something controversial here. I don't think you necessarily need like this very calculated, dialed in style to get started or to have a successful business. I would say if you look at my portfolio, yes, there is some commonalities and that that similarity in style has grown over time, but it absolutely like, you know, my portfolio three years ago was all over the map, but it had some great shots and it was convincing enough for the kinds of clients that I was approaching that it, it served its purpose, right? So I feel like we put a lot of undue pressure on finding the style when I think that that's something that just naturally sets in over time. If anybody else has a strong opinions about that not being the case, let me know. But I, I think that, you know, yes, you can start to gravitate towards different colors or different moods. For me, I like to work with a variety of different kinds of clients and they may have different kinds of looks and aesthetics and things that they like and they like the bright and airy or the dark and mood. Like I like to have a range of different things. You know, um, the one thing that I do think really helps when you put together your portfolio though, is thinking about the pagination of the image so even if you know they're not necessarily all connected stylistically like maybe some are very stark and kind of feel like pop art and a little bit more minimalistic and like color blocking as opposed to some of the others which are much more like bespoke and styled and rustic right like you can kind of visualize like if you have those two different things like can you create some sort of visual progression from one to the other um, something that I'm always doing is I'm selecting images for my portfolio is thinking about, okay, when I, I like I have the images um, or I'm going to add an image, like I'm at the place where I have images that I really am good with, but now I'm like adding an image. Where do I put that? So, okay, well this, this drink has a lot of orange in it and okay, there's this dish and it's got kind of some oranges and yellows. So like the color story is connecting those or, you know, maybe compositionally, like these have a similarity. So these could, you know, naturally flow one to the next. So finding sort of that connectedness from one to the next, but then feel, feel free to, you know, take them on a journey and show some range. I don't think that we need to create some sort of like, perfect curated style of like, this is only what I do. Now, that being said, there are photographers who are at their top end of the profession, right? Who are known for a signature style. It's like, that is what they get hired for. But I would say that came after years and years of developing and understanding what that style was. And so, you know, don't, don't try to rush into the style if, if you're not there yet. So hope, hopefully that helps. All right, let's see. Oh, this is a great one. This is some good input right here. Restaurants are looking for reels creators as well as photographers as a response to the algorithm changes. Such a great point. So really adding more of that video content, if that's something you can do. And like I said, I'm going to be creating more content around that. But let's be honest, like YouTube is full of great video content about creating reels, um, about creating videos. Uh, Skylar from We Eat Together, yesterday he posted a fantastic video all about uh, stop motion animation, which is something that I love and it's so much fun. Had some great advice there. So, I mean, the internet is full of education. Um, so the question though is what's the right approach to providing a solution? So here's always my approach. Every time I'm talking to a prospective client. Now, certainly doing some research ahead of time to see what they're currently doing. Um, I always, you know, it's a fine line, like I personally, Again, everybody's going to have their their perspectives on this, but I don't ever want to call their baby ugly, right? Like I can't tell you how many times I get pitched by people who are like, "We've looked at your YouTube channel, and we can see that you know you don't have great this or you don't have great that." And I go, "Excuse you, like you coming here and insulting my content, right? <laughs> I'm not hiring you." As opposed to the guy who, uh, the person who edits my videos, Yosef, who I've uh, shared a lot about on Instagram, and I love him, and he's an incredible video editor. If you need a referral, happy to make one. He did a great job when he first pitched me. 
you know, saying, I love your channel. I love your content. I especially love this video, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he said, and something that I specialize in is audio and helping to correct audio issues and things like that. And so if that's important to you now, I'm thinking he probably watched my channel and was like, oh, she's super inconsistent in terms of the audio, which I was because I am not an audio guru. Um, but he did. He said it in a way that wasn't calling my baby ugly, but hit a nerve of something that I wanted to see in my business and that I wanted to improve. And so what did I do? I responded. And now now we've been working together and I'm super duper happy about that. So taking that into consideration as you approach folks, like be mindful of like what are opportunities of things that they're not doing or they could be doing, um, but not saying, oh, I see you're not doing this. You really should. As opposed to saying, here's something that I offer. Um, if you're ever interested in that, I'd love to have a conversation with you. So, so I think that that's a really good approach and kind of opens the doors and, and giving them ideas of things that you've done for other companies that are similar to them that can also be that can also be a good good lead in all right uh let's see ah <laughs> yes 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 coffee i love it <laughs> oh thanks for joining us clinton uh oh here let's see what's this one Advantages or disadvantages other than cost of going with the Canon 90 mil or the Zeiss? I mean, I do not have hands-on experience with either of those lenses, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with the specs. So you'd have to look into that. I mean, Zeiss is definitely known for making fantastic glass. Um, that is a hallmark of them. So, you know, when you consider the price, again, also thinking about something that I think, too, that informs some of these decisions is, you know, we go back to that idea of the kinds of clients that we're working for, right? So what is what is that 90 mil or the 100 mil going to do for those kinds of clients or the kinds of work that you create? Like me personally, I do. I mean, I do cookbook work, but I also do a lot of digital work. And so having gear that's good for both of those things. But I would say if you're purely working on digital stuff, like, images are compressed on the internet. We, we're losing clarity anyway, <laughs> in detail anyway, because that's compressed. And so like investing 600 more dollars in a lens for a minimal, you know, addition of clarity, is it going to be that important to you? You know, but again, I, I also don't know your budget, right? And like what's expensive to one person is not expensive to another person. So it's all it's all a personal. Um let's see. Oh, I'm so glad. We're gonna have to tell Yosef. Yosef, let's all clap it up for Yosef quality of video and audio is so good. We did have an issue though. I'm sure some of y'all can remember this. This is just like completely unrelated, but ish. Um, there was a video I did a couple months ago when, when I explained like when I moved from Canon to Nikon, what happened, why I did that. Again, it wasn't meant to be like a sales pitch, just more of an explanation because so many folks were asking about it. Um, but there were like a handful of people like but like enough that I'm like, there, there's something going on here. People saying that the audio was bad on that video. And I'm like, what? And Yosef and I, like, I start getting this feedback from folks. I'm like, what? What happened? So then, <laughs> so I'm like emailing Yosef and he's like, I listened to it on like four devices. I'm using my great headphones. It sounds, it sounds good to me. And I'm like, sounds good to me. I tried it on all my devices. I'm contacting Lauren Karras. I'm contacting um, Rachel Koronek. I'm con like all these other people. I'm like, can you watch, watch this video real quick? Like, can you just tell me if the audio sounds off? And they're like, sounds good to me. But then there's like all these people are saying, it sounds like you're in a cave. Sounds like something's wrong. Yada, yada, yada. So I was like, this is weird. We couldn't figure it out. And so we we're like, well, it is what it is. Well, all of a sudden, Yosef then ended up like, like I can't remember how many weeks later, like four weeks later, he then pulled it up. I forget what he was listening to it on, but it was like a specific device that suddenly like the audio on that video sounded like crap. And it had to do with the phase of the audio being mono. But I, again, I am not an audio guru, but he was able to figure out like this particular, like there was an additional setting that he could set that could fix that. But it only ever happened on that video. So we're like, 
what happened with my recorder that it caused that to happen? It was it was wild. Ever since he solved that problem, so we shouldn't we shouldn't have that again. We haven't experienced that since. But that was a day that definitely threw me for a loop, and we're both like, what is happening? <laughs> oh. All right. Oh, here's a good question. All right. I want to pick up my camera and take some shots. I've got the camera and ideas for shots. Where should I put my first step in actually learning what to do? So I'd say, you know, get in there and start shooting and then look at what needs to be improved, right? So it's always for me is going and looking at an image like, okay, what's off? And if you're not, like I would say, here's the other thing though too. I, it depends on where you're at in your journey. If you're literally brand new to this and you haven't um, built that visual aptitude in a sense of like I, <laughs> like I have food blog, which still exists. You can still find it um, that I started in like, oh, seven, oh, eight. Um, that I was taking pictures and I bought my first DSLR and I had no clue what white balance was. I had no clue what a lot of things were, um, but especially white balance. But I would look at the images and I was like, oh, these look great, right? I look at those images now and I'd say, Lord have mercy, they are orange as orange can be, right? I hadn't built that visual aptitude for myself to understand like what was what was wrong. I mean, again, maybe you really love orangey white balance. That's great, um, you know, to each their own. But I didn't have that visual aptitude to understand what was wrong. So if that's where you're at in your journey, then finding some other friends that have a bit more experience than you. So maybe that's connecting with people on Instagram. Maybe that's connecting with people like, you know, folks who are in my courses. We have the community section where, you know, you can share images and, and get feedback. I would say, you know, I'm always really leery about folks putting images into public forums and asking for feedback when that's not necessarily a safe space. I think, you know, especially too, if you're particularly sensitive to feedback, um, you know, when it's like nameless randos of the internet, it they may come back with some really like snarky or unhelpful feedback. But if you're in a safe place where there are other people who are um, mutually invested in each other's benefit, that, that getting feedback from other photographers who you can trust their Put and take that information and go, okay, so people are saying that my lighting is not great, like, or that my lighting needs work, um, or that, you know, I'm always shooting and it's like really flat, or I'm always shooting and it's underexposed, or, you know, what, whatever it is, um, then that's where you get curious and go, okay, well, can I dig into uh, figuring out how to learn about that thing and what kind of resources are th out there um, are available. Like for me, um, when I talk about learning about lighting, certainly, I mean, it's a textbook and it's boring for most humans out there, but for anybody who's like me, and I know plenty of y'all out there, uh, light science and magic is sort of to me like a great baseline. Uh, we did a we did a whole series on uh, the Bite Shop Book Club. This was January 2019. So if you go back into my archives, there's a whole series of uh, kind of doing lessons from that book and applying it to food photography. But to me, like that is a really great baseline book. And I feel like lighting is really one of those things, like the really great place to start. Because if you can really figure out lighting, that sort of solves a lot of the <laughs> solves a lot of the problems. Um, and so, so that, that is my recommendation there. But starting to just get curious about what can I add to this um, and starting to, oh, the video is lagging a bit. Mm. Hope, I wonder, if, darn internet. Internet's been a little flaky around here, but um, all right. So hopefully, hopefully that gives you some, some good indication. I'm going to take a couple more and then I'm going to jet off because I, I got some work to do here in the studio today. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love this. Great recommendation from Maya's Kitchen Daydreams. Took like 50 photos in apples, slightly different settings when I started. This is so true, right? Like I think that we overcomplicate things too. And you're like, I see folks do this in my lighting course. You know, they come in and like guns a blaze in like, okay, I'm going to do this really complicated dish and I'm going to do all this composition and I'm going to do all these things. And then I'm going to try to figure out the lighting. And I feel like you're really setting yourself up for, um, failure in that because you're like concerned about everything else other than the one thing that you're really there to learn. So whatever it is that you're there to learn and then yeah, experimentation, you know, I was doing a, 
uh, a live workshop recently where I was like, you know, we've got this scene, but here, if I make just this one little tweak to the lighting, oh, look how much that changes it. And I make this one little tweak, oh, look how that changes it. Right. And that's exactly how I've approached things over the years. It's just those little, those little tweaks. So I love that. How many of us, like, <laughs> I'm like, show of hands, how many of us have like umpteen bajillion photos of like a random piece of fruit on the table, right? Like an apple or a pear or like we have, we all have those images in our archives. I mean, maybe you deleted them, but I've got quite a few. Um, all right. Oh, good question. So we answered this. I kind of went through it in the presentation portion of this video. So this will be available for replay once we finish up here in just a little bit. But go back to that, to the recommendations about where to start in terms of creating a list of uh, clients that you want to start going after and thinking about that local work and thinking about smaller companies and businesses that you can more quickly gain access to. So, um, but if you're just starting out in food photography and not necessarily making a business of it, maybe that's your question. Um, where you're going to want to get started is to me, and I'm, I know plenty of other folks would back me up on this, is learn to shoot your camera in manual mode. If you're not currently shooting your camera in manual mode, uh, that is going to, like, I think about all the game changers of, like, when something that, um, like, just had massive impact on the quality of my images, manual mode, 100% get there, right? Um, unless you're shooting with a phone, then fully, you know, whatever piece of gear it is that you're using to shoot your photography, if you can know that piece of gear inside and out and become a master of it, that will absolutely set you up for success, no matter where you're at in your journey. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, good. I'm glad the lag has solved itself. <laughs> so true. Anybody who's here in Phoenix, there's quite a few of y'all. Uh, we've had some weather issues and it's maybe that's causing the internet to have a moment. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love this. I only have pictures of cheesecake on my Instagram. Oh, that's okay. Don't feel sad about that. I love cheesecake. That's a great, that's a great subject. So, but now, okay. Now that you've got cheesecake really mastered, what can you move on to next? Maybe we got to move to pie. Maybe we got to move to drinks, you know? So I think that that can be a really smart approach though. Um, Rachel Koronek, my friend over at Two Love Studio, something I've always admired that she does is she'll find something that she really wants to focus on and she will double down on that. Like she had a whole number of months that she just focused on meringue. Like all, all the girl was doing was meringue, right? And I and now she's like a master of meringue. I'm like, if somebody needs a great meringue or if I need tips about meringue, you better believe I'm calling Rachel, right? And now she's like really focused on drinks, right? That's where she, so I don't think that's bad to focus. Sometimes I think if we jump around too much, um, that can, that can, you know, hamper that learning. So don't, don't feel bad about that. I love cheesecake. Mr. Simon doesn't love cheesecake. He's not a fan, but all right. Oh man. Okay. So tethering, tethering causes all the issues, right? <laughs> so, um, one thing to check, um, I, definitely the quality of the cable can have an impact. Um, I've recently started using, um, area 51 cables and they have been super reliable, super good. Um, so that, that may, it may be, maybe the cable, um, something else. So I'm wondering where it is. I will, I will link it in the show notes after if I can find it, there is a troubleshooting guide, um, that Rachel Kornick, she has her tethered flow, um, course that has everything on tethering, but she has a specific like troubleshooting. Um, but so many times it has to do with the cord or something else that can cause a lot of issues is your operating system. Reasons why if you are specifically a Mac user, don't upgrade your operating system right away. Like when they release the new one, like wait, <laughs> because inevitably the new one will always break your tethering software. Like it's guaranteed, right? So I mean, it's not guaranteed, but it happens more often than not. Um, so it may be an operating system thing. So double check on the Canon website. Um, depends on what tethering software you're using too. Like if it's the Canon EOS software, look at what their requirements are for the operating system. Um, so that can be a great, that can be a great place to start too. All right. 
Oh, yes. Ah, clap it up for that. Yes. It's just like I've been working on strength training a little bit more recently, and it's more fun to hop around to different exercises. But really, if you just do like the squat over and over again with good form, and then the next day you do something else over and over again with good form, it's, that's going to have a lot bigger impact. So Bruce Lee knows. Bruce Lee knows. I love it. Oh, this is great news. Great news. You bought your flash in January. Oh, flash can be so scary, right? Oh, but once you figure it out, again, this is why I'm such a big, huge advocate for teaching about artificial lighting. Because once you figure it out and you're like, oh, this opens up so many, so many new possibilities. So encouraging. I'm so excited for you. That's wonderful. Way to take the leap. I know that's scary, but scary things can uh, yield big, big wins. I love it. All right. Well, with that, it is now 9.15. I'm sure we've all got plenty of other things we got to go do today. It's Friday. Got big, anybody got big plans? We're going to go out for wings tonight. It's Friday wing night. So <laughs> we're going to do that. But thank you so much for hanging out with me here today. Um, like I mentioned, Profitable Pricing, it is linked down below. So feel free to go check that out. And thank you as always for hanging out here with me. I just I love spending time with y'all. And I love uh, the conversations we have and the encouragement, all this wonderful encouragement here in the comment section today. Um, so, so exciting. So with that, uh, yeah, I will be back next, next Thursday, next Thursday, brand new video, how to use uh, art to inspire your food photography, get you outside of a rut. We want to shake loose of any sort of creative ruts we may be in. So that will be next week, uh, followed by much more content to come. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much love to you. Hugs and kisses and smooches and all the things. And I'll see you later. All right. Adios, amigos. <laughs>